Nearly five years ago, the federal government became ensnared in corruption allegations in what came to be known as the SNC-Lavalin affair. Over the past few months, controversy swirled in Ontario about invitees to a stag and doe reception held by the Premier. Canada's place on Transparency International's corruption perception ranking was unchanged this year at 14th. 14th! With us now on what Canada needs to do to improve on that, in our nation's capital, Akash Maharaj, Ambassador at Large for the Global Organization of Parliamentarians Against Corruption. And Gary Clement, who spent 34 years with the RCMP investigating organized crime. And here in our studio, we welcome James Cohen, Executive Director of the aforementioned Transparency International Canada. James, good to have you back here in our studio. And to our friends in Points Beyond, thanks for joining us as well. I want to pick up on that number 14. Mm -hmm. Now, on the one hand, 14 out of whatever, 200 isn't bad. But this is Canada, and my hunch is we think we ought to be better than 14th. So what's going on here? Well, not only that, we've actually been sliding over the last five to seven years. Canada's been on a downward trend. We took a big fall last year, and not only did our, our score stayed the same, but we've been bypassed by countries like Ireland and Australia, who have managed to improve their status. So there are some things that the government is signaling that are going right. So we will get a beneficial ownership registry at the federal level this year. Uh, there's plans to have a Canadian financial crime agency at some point, either the plan this year or by next year. So those are really good signs. But at the same time, we still see stumbling blocks by the government. So there's continuous ethics scandals or infringements that we see with little repercussions. There's... Uh, well, we'll, we'll start to unpack some of this as we go along here. Yeah. But uh, Akash, let me get you in here since you're, uh, you keep an eye on things around the world. Denmark is number one. What's Denmark doing we're not doing? Well, in the briefest terms, Denmark is enforcing its laws. Canada ranks very highly amongst all nations of the world for the propriety of our laws. The OECD, the Organization of Developed States, actually ranks Canada as at the top of the list for its laws. That is to say, there is no other developed state in the world that has better anti-corruption laws than Canada. But we are also at the bottom of the OECD's list for the enforcement of our laws. We are a country that is exemplary in saying the right things and even committing those things to the, to the law. But we have a terrible track record in enforcing those laws. Regrettably, the story for anti-corruption in Canada, at least from a political level, is significantly words without deeds. Gary, can I get your view on that as well? Do we really have the best laws in the world? We're just not enforcing them? Well, I think we've we've got some decent laws. There's no doubt about it. I would agree wholeheartedly. We definitely are not enforcing them. Um, but we've got some huge weaknesses. We've got probably some of the worst whistleblowing laws in the world for, um, uh, you know, a recognized or top 20 countries. Um, we We really haven't had effective enforcement on the federal level for a number of years. And I think that is going uh, or contributes to what we're seeing around, uh, today and really contributes to what we're seeing in the area of corruption. I think that's, uh, you know, an area where Canada really needs to take a real deep look at itself. Uh, parliamentarians need to take a look at it. We need to fill those gaps. And if not, I, I can see us sliding even further. Gary, let me pick up on one of those things you mentioned, the whistleblowing laws. What don't we have that we need to have that would make it safer for whistleblowers to shine a light on corrupt practices? Well, essentially, we don't have any, any protections, especially within the uh, civil service. Uh, there's virtually no um, protection whatsoever. The uh, United States has gone leaps and bounds ahead of us. I'm not saying it's a great system, but it's at least gone ahead of us. So what we really need to do is have uh, very committed whistleblowing laws in this country where instead of people are, are being ostracized, they need to be patted on the back because there is a lot going wrong in this country. There's a lot going wrong uh, within our civil service, and I think we owe it to Canadians to get it right. I would suspect, James, that a country like Canada ought to be at least in the top 10 on your index. How long since we've been in the top 10? We fell out maybe about five, uh, six years ago, we fell out of the top 10. And what prevents us from returning there at the moment? Well, I think we just need to 
not just because it's a number of things, but there's uh, a number of structural things that we need to do. So getting that beneficial ownership registry in place might help us. Whistleblower laws, better access to information laws would definitely help. I think also maybe seeing some repercussions on some of the ethics scandals that have been happening uh, at the federal level. And then you know, we're talking at the federal level, but as you alluded to, the provinces have a role to play in our perception as well. Mm. So we need to also factor in what's happening at the provincial level, even down to the municipal level, say uh, the Strong Mayors Act, and is that creating an oversight problem within our cities? We're actually on, on Wednesday of this week going to do a follow-up on the provincial scene, so we'll, we'll stick, if we can, to uh, the more federal uh, look at things now. You, you talked about the beneficial registry system. Just uh, help us understand, what, what does that look like? So we've been talking about uh, a beneficial ownership registry for a couple of years in Canada, and we're due to get it this year. So really, that just means who is the true owner at the end of a company. You can have company ABC owned by company 123 open, or owned by Bob. Who's Bob at the end of the day? Bob might be a per perfectly legitimate business person, or Bob could be a politically exposed person who stole a lot of their wealth from their country and is stashing in Canada because it's really easy to do that. So with a registry, it's not a panacea for solving this issue, but it's a desperately needed tool that we haven't had. Hmm. Okay. Akash, corruption, when we talk corruption, uh, I suspect people think first and foremost about politicians on the take. Um, I think there's probably too many Canadians already who think that, that people get into politics so they can be closer to the trough, as it were. Um, that may be fair, maybe an unfair allegation. What are your thoughts on the presence of sort of that much corruption around our political elites today? It's a somewhat complex story because I don't think it's the case that large numbers of politicians are becoming tremendously wealthy as a result of their public service. That would be a facile and largely inaccurate representation of, of the facts. Instead, it's more a case where corruption in the political process involves wealthy and powerful groups within society being able to take advantage of a weak legal structure to use Canada as a base of operations. Interestingly enough, it isn't always the case that those corporations and organizations exploit Canadians, but instead that they exploit Canada as a jurisdiction to commit acts of fraud and corruption around the world. That is a significant problem for us as Canadians. To give but one extreme example, one very telling example, the World Bank has a prescribed list of about 250 corporations that are not allowed to touch any project that is being funded by the World Bank. These are some of the most corrupt organizations in the world on that list, run by some of the most despicable people on the planet. Of the 250 companies on that list, 100 of them are Canadian. Hmm. And that, I think, is something that should not make us as Canadians proud. Can I just follow up with this? You know, um, it's one thing for um, an unseemly corporation or corporate executive or, or you know, bad player to ask a politician to do something that's not in the public interest. It's another thing for the politician to actually do that. What, in your experience, prevents politicians from simply saying, no, I can't do that. It's not in the public interest. Well, there are many facets to it. Sometimes it's as simple as the fact that we are a relatively small country where the relationships between our political leaders and our business leaders are very close too close, in fact, there is a kind of insidious form of corruption that does not necessarily involve the exchange of funds so much as the exchange of favors or the, even the exchange of social approbation. But in addition to that, as we're seeing with allegations of interference by the Communist Party of China in the political process, there are severe vulnerable spots in the way our political process operates. And the lower down the chain one goes, the more vulnerable it is. Political parties, for example, are largely unregulated in this country. We th tend to think of politics as members of parliament, ministers, the prime minister, but we forget that before those people can occupy those seats, they have to go through their internal party processes. If you can capture that process, then you can capture the political apparatus itself. And as foreign governments are demonstrating to us, it requires relatively little effort, relatively little money, and relatively little influence to be able to take control of party nominations through nominations, who's a member of parliament, through, through parliament, who is a minister, and ultimately what the prime minister can or cannot do. We need, as a country, to be more alert to the fact that while our eyes are transfixed on the prime minister and ministers, 
they sit upon an edifice that is vulnerable to corruption. Gary, I noticed you smiled when I asked that last question, so I'll follow up by asking you how much of a link you think there is between, say, uh, you know, the criminal netherworld of this country and, um, and our elected officials. Well, bottom line is we've we've becoming a we have become a staging ground for transnational organized crime. A lot of that has to do with the fact that we've got extremely weak um, federal enforcement right now. I think that's been well publicized over the last three four years, um, and the fact that politicians when they take up positions in parliament, they go in the same as the average system, and they're very naive when it comes to. Uh, what transnational organized crime groups uh, are, how they operate. Uh, they aren't well briefed on how to deal with individuals that approach them and, and they see it as they're going to get a donation for to get elected or for the party. All these things has to be brought in and more due diligence has to be done on the people. The reality of it is with the legislation or with our judicial system, um, it's become virtually ineffective in a lot of respects. Uh, all you have to do is uh, look at the Jordan uh, uh, Supreme Court ruling that requires, uh, you know, a speedy trials with timelines. You look at uh, uh, Stinchcomb uh, decision, which requires full and frank disclosure. Both of those have resulted in me and you've seen them in the news. Most of our major uh, organized crime cases that are large have been turfed out of court. The, uh, you know, I like to uh, basically a statement I use now, I think almost that justice has brought itself into disrepute. Um, we really need to get a handle on this and look at it because uh, what people aren't realizing is transnational organized crime is taking advantage of that. And we have many transnational organized crime groups operating in this country. Um, you know, we talked about the companies that are operating that are on that list. You know, a hundred of them are Canadian. That doesn't surprise me one bit with the fact that we really are doing an ineffective job. And that transcends itself right into Parliament. Uh, what you see, I've worked on the Chinese uh, problem uh, since the early 90s. Um, all of what we're seeing now with the relationship with China and the, uh, you know, I, I would say the impeding in our democracy does not surprise me. The fact that we've got politicians that uh, seem to have far too close a relationship does not surprise me. That's been going on for uh, a number of decades. And that is the reason why we're still sitting where we are. Uh, we really need to get a handle on this and have people wake up to realize that I don't think this uh, bodes well for our democracy if we keep it up. Well, James, let me find out who you think is more responsible. And to that end, let's just look back over the last three decades. Liberals were in power from 93 to 06. Then the Conservatives under Stephen Harper, 06 to 15. Then the Liberals back in again under Justin Trudeau from 15 until now. Are, are Liberals or Conservatives worse than the other at getting to the bottom of this? Uh, I'm not going to get into the, the, the which party is best because I think there's a number of things about the system's level of corruption. I think that uh, Gary alluded to that a lot of politicians just don't know about the system's levels of corruption or don't care. I mean, you know, we saw ethics issues come up uh, in the last election in 2021, and both the NDP and the Conservatives put on their platforms that they want to enhance penalties for ethics violations, but we haven't seen that come up. Uh, imagine the Conservatives and NDP work together to push a bill like that forward. So sometimes there's talk about wanting to do well, sometimes there is legitimate practice, and a lot of times it's pressure coming from outside. So like the Beneficial Ownership Registry, that's the Financial Action Task Force globally and other actors that are saying, Canada, you have to do this. Uh, remember during SNC-Lavalin, it was the OECD that kind of gave a, a tut-tut warning to Trudeau mm -hmm. about the, the implications of the Prime Minister's office uh, involved with the Minister of Justice. So sometimes you need that external pressure to either let them know that they've gone too far or even make uh, politicians aware that something is going on. If it's not a partisan thing, then, is it the case of whoever's in wants to get away with more, and who's ever out thinks whoever's in ought to be doing way better, but then when the outs get in, they're just as bad. Is that fair to say? 
It's unfortunately, it can be fair to say that uh, we don't always see the the ethics um, reforms come in after somebody is in opposition and saber rattled and said, we need better. Uh, you don't yeah, always see something come in. So it is great that we see a push for beneficial ownership uh, now. It is great um, that there's been some pushes for open government within this government. In the previous uh, conservative government, there was a harsher push on foreign companies with uh, the remedi- or the um, integrity regime for procurement. Mm-hmm. Some say maybe it went too harsh, but it was because the OECD was giving uh, Canada a bad rap that we weren't doing enough. So maybe we went too far in one direction. Akash, let me ask you about the province of Quebec here because uh, surveys have been done across the country and apparently the numbers are the highest in the province of Quebec in terms of who's worried the most about bribery and theft of public funds. Uh, Quebecers, 77% of them worry and people who have particularly good memories may remember that more than a decade ago, Quebec was on the cover of Maclean's magazine with the big headline that it was the most corrupt province in the whole country. They didn't like being called that very much. Uh, But nevertheless, that's what McLean said they found. Um, Okay, all these years later, do Quebecers, in your judgment, have a reason still to fear the level of corruption happening in their society? I think all Canadians do. I think the people of Quebec have had what I would call the short shot shot of exposure. And that actually is to the good for the people of Quebec. A great deal of the corruption that has occurred in municipal politics and through SNC, Lovellin in particular, have hit the headlines in Quebec. And that, I think, is responsible for why the people of Quebec are alert to the presence of corruption in their society or in their province. But that's not to say that that level of corruption isn't widespread across our country. It's largely to say that instead, we are less aware of it in other provinces. The question, I think, for Quebecers is, is, will they react to what they have learned? The question for the rest of Canada is, will we learn what Quebecers have already discovered? That is one of the greatest challenges for all of us who are involved in trying to fight corruption. That is that in the past, it was enough to expose it and that sunlight, as they say, is the best disinfectant. But we've now reached a point in history where the average person has become so over-communicated, is so inundated with information, and is so fatigued by outrage that it has become that much more difficult, having exposed them to the fact of corruption, to motivate them to act against it. The hard reality is that you cannot shame the shameless, and we have reached a point in history where our political class has become entirely shameless. Hmm. Uh, Gary, I stand to be corrected on this, but I think in the course of my lifetime watching politics in this country, I think more politicians from Saskatchewan have gone to jail than in any other province for malfeasance. And uh, I, I, I guess I'd ask you to follow up on Akash's comments that there may, this, there may be a perception that Quebec is the worst, but... In fact, is it? No, absolutely not. And I think it's an, uh, you know, and I, when, when that uh, inquiry, the Charbonneau Commission occurred, uh, I reached out to the provincial government of Ontario and said, we should do the same because believe me, it's, it's bad or worse. And if you don't look, uh, you don't know what you have. And I think British Columbia proved that one with the Cullen Commission. Um, That's in British Columbia. That's correct. The Cullen in British Columbia. Other provinces just haven't looked. And I, you know, the bottom line is, does it take a public inquiry? We know what the situation is. And there's lots of people out there uh, that can brief government to tell them we the gaps. Uh, we can tell them where the gap needs to be filled. Um, the, I just don't think there's a will right now to do anything. Uh, you know, we've sort of chugged along with uh, knowing that there's uh, some corruption, knowing that this is existing, in, especially in, in municipalities and provincial contracts. I mean, organized crime has been involved in a lot of construction for as long as I've been alive and will continue to be because we really don't do a lot about it. Well, I, re- I was going to say, I remember when George Drew was premier, they had a royal commission into this at which Drew testified. I have to restate that a bit. I actually don't remember it firsthand. Believe it or not, I didn't cover that inquiry back in the 1940s. But but you're right. This issue of organized crime being involved in the business of the province of Ontario has been around for a long time. James, let me throw a tweet at you that you tweeted at us not too long ago. You said, the West can't keep up wanting to be the defenders of the rule of law while protecting the global system of financial secrecy. The West can't keep being the provider of aid and hoarder of stolen wealth. 
Unpack that for us, if you would. What are you trying to say? In the West, we like to say that we'll fight corruption, that we'll uh, end anti-money laundering, but we created a system in our economies where we hide the wealth. So if we look at Russia's invasion of Ukraine that started a year ago, the West put on sanctions against Russia, thinking that will topple them, all of a sudden to realize that Russians were evading these sanctions because a lot of that money was held through these numbered companies I talked about earlier in our own economies. So our system that we created and turned a willful blindness towards to enrich ourselves, we actually made a tool against ourselves to stop kleptocrats from weaponizing our own economies. So I think since that year, a lot of the West has woken up to the security implications of corruption. But we have to unravel a lot of the mess we created. At the same time, we've been talking about aid uh, to say to Africa or Latin America, where the African continent is actually a net creditor to the rest of the world. But we have stored enough of the stolen cash from impoverished countries into our own economies. So there's a lot that we can do about giving, about sending sanctions, but there's a lot that we have to do here at home to change things if we really want to address corruption as a security issue, as a global inequality issue, and even as an environmental issue. Quick follow-up here. Whenever we see, either in the newspapers or on a registry or something, a uh, lobbying registry, if we see a numbered company, should we assume that whoever's behind that numbered company has malfeasance in mind and that's why they are a numbered company? No, there's tons of legal reasons to have a numbered company. There's a lot of people doing legitimate business who didn't even realize possibly that uh, there are implications to them uh, using a numbered company. The point is that uh, there are businesses that are the front line, the banks, the accountants, the lawyers, uh, the realtors. When they see that numbered company, it, it is the law that they have to figure out who's behind it, uh, and they need the tools to figure it out. Because there are a significant number of people trying to use that system to hide their dirty cash here in Canada. We've called it snow washing here. Snow washing, right. Uh, Gary, back to you. Much of the illicit money apparently flows through our banks. So let me ask you about how culpable our banks are for allowing illicit money to end up in their vaults in the first place. The well, bottom line is money laundering can occur without uh, banks, lawyers, and accountants. It just can't. Um, and so money is going, is the money going through our banks? A good portion of it is because it can't move around the world without it. They need the SWIFT system. Um, so it is happening. Are banks culpable? Um, I don't think they're doing it uh, being willfully blind. I think in, not all of them. Some of them have been. There's no doubt about it. The bottom line is we're dealing with sophisticated organizations today, uh, sophisticated organizations that uh, have operate because they know about the secrecy laws and where to go and numbered companies and how to set up these networks that make it almost impossible to follow a trail. So I think banks in good conscience are doing their job job and trying to do it well. Uh, but it's going to slip through and we're going to continue to see this. Uh, beneficial ownership properly done that enables access and with uh, sharing provisions uh, allowed between the banks, uh, I think will help. Uh, we need, I still believe, and I've argued this uh, right from day one, the lawyers, uh, the, the legal uh, societies need to be brought in under the regime in some manner. I know the Supreme Court has ruled very strongly on it, but I believe there is a way that we can have some control. Um, it Without it, I don't think we'll improve in what we're doing today, and we're going to continue to get worse. Last few minutes here. Let's see if we can get a couple of more questions on the record. Akash, in the next uh, few years, uh, the government of Canada is going to welcome, through immigration, uh, perhaps as many as a half a million new Canadians, potential new Canadians, into our midst. And some of them are going to come from countries where, let's face it, nepotism is a way of life. It's just the, uh, simply stated the way other countries do business. How difficult do you think it is or will be to cross into a culture where, theoretically at least, uh, we're not supposed to be about nepotism here? It's an interesting question, and I would emphasize theoretically, because there's a great deal of nepotism in our own society. Just as an aside, two-thirds of the fabled 1% in Canada are people who work or work 
for the same corporations as their fathers, and that, of course, includes the Prime Minister of Canada. Nepotism isn't a problem just with the third world or the developing world. It's also a problem here. And just as it's fair to ask, if people come from other societies, is it possible that we will have difficulty bringing them into our, uh, our standards of laws? I think we also need to admit that our standards of laws often fall short of those of people who are coming to Canada. Well, Having I got to, okay, hang on, hang on. I got to jump in for a second, Akash, because I think of nepotism as daddy got me the job. You know, Pierre Trudeau didn't get Justin Trudeau the job as Prime Minister of Canada. Yes, he's got the same last name, and there's no doubt the last name helps him in some cases and hurts him in others, but daddy didn't get him the job. We can't say that, can we? Well, I wouldn't go to any, to any one person, but I would say that the aggregate, aggregate statistics tell us a telling story. I don't think that if you look at the fact that two-thirds of Canadians who are in the, the top 1% of earners work, work or work for the same corporations as their fathers is a coincidence whether actively or passively, that those relationships enable them to get entree into corridors of power that were not available to other people. And it raises an interesting question about what it is, what is it that we mean by corruption? Do we just mean breaking the law? That is the most obvious form of corruption. But there are also forms of corruption that involve actions that are unjust. I don't think that Canadians fear that we are becoming a lawless society. I think that Canadians fear that we're becoming a society where the law itself is unjust, where we live in a system where you don't have to break the law in order to, to prosper in a way that is unfair, because the very structure of our society is itself unfair. This is perhaps not fair to say to um, specifically to Canadians, but in general around the world, ordinary criminals break the law, but the world's worst criminals, they make the laws. Hmm. All right, James, in our last minute here, we heard about better whistleblowing legislation uh, earlier from Gary. Give us one more idea that's on your list of things that we need in this country to make this kind of stuff go away. Well, I mean, unfortunately, we'll never make all of it go away, but we can definitely make things uh, better. I think there is a call out right now for improvements in our ethics laws, at least for the idea that there would be some kind of better repercussions for those ethics. Uh, when we only see a couple hundred dollars in charges and no statutory uh, demotion for a minister, you know, it sends uh, a wrong signal to everyone that, well, even if I get caught, it's a slap on the wrist. Do honest mistakes happen? Of course they happen. Uh, but when they successively happen and when the leader is successively happening, having uh, ethics violations, we can't just always turn to, well, the voters will decide because there are so many issues that are on the plate. Sometimes people have to balance you know, the devil you know with the devil you don't like, then that's not to make a, a specific comment on any politician. But you know, any other job, it wouldn't be, oh, let's wait until your performance review. Uh, if there's a violation, there's going to be some kind of repercussion. So I think starting with um, those ethics rules would be something to help out. Gotcha. That's James Cohen from Transparency International Canada. We also thank Akash Maharaj from the Global Organization of Parliamentarians Against Corruption and Gary Clement, 34 years with the RCMP investigating organized crime, for coming onto our program tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks thank for having you. me. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.